On today's show, we'll be answering the question from a user, can you do long exposure photography combined with the high resolution mode on the Lumix G9? The easy answer is yes, but it's not quite that straightforward. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here on youtube.com slash photojoseph, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you're not here live, you could be and you should be. It's a lot of fun. If you're here live, you get to do this, participate in the chat. See, all these people are participating in the chat. The chat is fun. It's great to be here live. I get to answer your questions and respond in real time, or at least close enough to it. Uh, and if, of course, you can't watch this live, then watch it whenever you can. We appreciate that, too. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about high resolution mode on the G9 in combination with long exposure mode. So last week's show, last Friday's show, we'll link to that up here. Last Friday's show, I talked about long exposure, long exposure photography on the iPhone. It's really cool, right? And the things you can do on an iPhone are pretty impressive, frankly. And someone asked in the Q&A, well, could I do that on the G9, but using the high resolution mode? So if you're not familiar with the high resolution mode, we've done a whole video on that as well. Again, I'll link to that up here. The high resolution mode on the G9 is where the, the sensor shifts, uh, not even a pair, I think it's half a pixel over each direction, up, down, left, right, all over the place, and it stitches together a series of images to create a photo that is four times the resolution of its native size. It becomes an 80 megapixel file. It's twice the width, twice the height of data. Now, that image is created over a series of captures, nine, I think it was nine, eight, nine, nine captures, and so those obviously aren't happening at the same time. They happen in a very, very rapid fire sequence, but they're not at the same time, which means you can't do this type of photography of anything moving. It really only works for static subjects. I mean, if you're, you know, you've got a tree way off in the distance and it's like, you know, moving in the wind a little bit, you're going to be okay. But you can't do this of a person walking down the street, a car driving, nothing like that. So the question came of, could we do the long exposure photography, the long exposure where the whole purpose is to blur movement? So the obvious easy choice in what I shot as a sample is the waterfall. You put the camera on the tripod. Uh, you're, uh, you're at a waterfall where you've got your rocks and your trees that are not moving. The water obviously is moving. You do a long exposure so that you get that beautiful, soft motion blur that we love to see in, in these kind of waterfall pictures. Can you do that in high resolution mode? And I thought, this is a really interesting question because the, the long exposure mode, the longest exposure you can do, I'm sorry, the high resolution mode, the long, longest exposure you can do is one second long. It doesn't, it maxes out at that. It also maxes out at F8. You can't stop it down any more than that. So F8, one second long, that's your limit. Okay, so one second, a one second exposure, shooting nine of these in a row, that's nine seconds of exposure that is going to blend together. Irrelevant for the static subjects. Clearly, there's going to be movement over the course of those, those individual one seconds that's going to be brought together. The movement is dramatic. It's the waterfall bouncing all over the place. You're going to get this big, wishy, blurry thing. But all of those are going to get blended together. What's it going to look like? Is this going to work? So the short answer is it does work, but there's a very, very interesting artifact that comes out of it. And we're going to talk about how to fix that as well. It's, it's a, I think it's a fascinating thing. Before I jump over to the demo, I'll just bring this up real quick. I want to remind you guys of our value for value prospect. If you feel like you take value, if you have gained value from today's show, then I would appreciate you considering throwing a little bit of value back. Head over to photojoseph.com support, and there's lots of different ways you can provide value to the show from Patreon to PayPal's to shopping in the affiliate store, like if you decide to buy a G9, or even hiring me directly. So please do, uh, please do check that out if you feel like you've learned something of value from today's show. All right, let's, let's switch over to Lightroom here. So I've got my G9 photos in Lightroom. And I had the camera set to shoot both the, let me turn off the clipping here, both the standard and the high res mode at the same time. Let me get to where the exposures aren't shifting. Here we go. So here's a great example of the exact same photo. Here's the standard resolution one. And there is the blended one, the, the high resolution one. So if we look at, let's go to the library module here just to double, triple verify this. Uh, we'll look at the resolution. So here's the dimensions right here. You can see this in the corner. So this is the high res one, 10,368 10, pixels by 7,776. If I go to the next picture, it's the same photo. We are at our standard 5184 by 3888 resolution. So the reason that the water looks different is pretty logical, right? It's because it's a bunch of photos of that one second, one second after another after another, and then blended together. So what we actually get is an even more blurry water image, right? which is great, right? That's the whole point here. So that's our standard resolution and then the combined resolutions. This could maybe find with a little bit better exposure. That one's kind of cool, nice and dark and rich. I've actually added a little bit of enhancement to that one as well. So pretty good, right? Pretty cool looking. We'll work with this one here. 
So, okay, on first glance, you're going, it works, done, sweet. But then as I started looking at it more closely, I realized there's something a little bit funny going on. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna reset this one. We're looking at the high resolution picture. Let me just reset this thing. And I'm going to zoom into one to one. Now, I don't know how well this is gonna translate through the YouTube screen, but can you see a very slight cross hatching pattern showing up on there? Can you see that at all? Let me zoom in a little bit farther. I'm gonna take this up to two to one and it starts to become quite a bit more apparent in there. And we'll take it up to four to one. Look at the pattern, see what's going on in there? Isn't that interesting? Now, it's when you really think about it, it does make sense. And there we're at 11 to one at this point. So you can definitely see this pattern. And there it's, we're so close, you can barely see the pattern. Let's go back to four to one. You can clearly see some kind of pattern happening here. So what actually is this? Now, I, I don't have a real, I don't have like a really good technical answer other than we are stitching together a series of photos. Clearly, the image has changed between all of the pictures that it has stitched together. And I'm guessing that because of the method that it, sh that it creates this picture, by shifting the sensor and using uh, the photo sites, overlapping photo sites to create this larger resolution image, that we're seeing some kind of strange replication and hence the pattern as we combine these different images. I, I know that doesn't make total sense. And in my head, it's like it kind of almost sort of makes sense, but not completely. But I get it, right? We are blending together a series of pictures that are not the same, expecting to get something that is the same out of it. So seeing some kind of anomaly would be expected in here. Okay, so there's that anomaly. Clearly at this point you're going, well, then I can't shoot this way. I couldn't do a big print of this because you'd see the pattern. Well, there's a lot of ways you can get rid of that pattern. Now I've been playing with some. I haven't gone and finished an image yet. And I think what I'm going to do is spend some more time doing this, finishing an image, and then printing it really, really big to see how it looks. Because I think that I think this is really cool. And I think that if you want to do a really big print, which was what the original question was about, the original person who asked the question was asking this because they wanted to do really, really big, soft waterfall type pictures. Hence, could we do this? And because the area that has the pattern is blurry by definition, right? It's the blurry water. We can easily fix this. And we're gonna take a look at a couple of methods right now, but you can, you can go in and just simply blur it. Add a little Gaussian blur to it until it goes away, but we're gonna look at some things that are, might be a little bit more effective and you can kind of build it up if you will. Um, which I think, is, I think is just fascinating. So let's, let's take a look at, let's go back to the screen here. Um, first thing I'm gonna actually do is turn off sharpening. So by default, Lightroom has applied a level of sharpening. And if we go to, I think, did I just pass it? I think I passed it. Where was it? There we go, detail. And if I turn this off entirely, right away it drops significantly. It's still there, right? There's no doubt it's still there, but it has dropped significantly. So the sharpening is enhancing that pattern. Okay, so that's first number one. Oh, and also I wanted to show you this. Let me turn this back on. And I'm gonna pan over to a part of the image where there is not, here we go, uh, where there's not the movement. So there's a rock. Let me zoom out of this a little bit more. Just to show you, you can really quite clearly see pattern, no pattern, right? Pattern, no pattern. So it really clearly is something that has to do with the, uh, with the movement, the moving pixels in there. Okay, so I'm gonna, let's go back into this thing a little bit. We'll zoom back into four to one, get nice and close. Okay, so I've turned off the sharpening. That helps tremendously. I'm gonna go over to the brush tools and under the brush, we have the ability to do a more brush adjustment. This is to remove a moiré pattern. Is it a moiré pattern? I don't really know, probably not, but it kind of helps. So I've got that cranked up to 100, uh, flow and density on the brush are all the way up, and I'm just going to brush a little bit into here, and we can see that it starts to go away even more. Again, not completely gone, but it is partially gone there, so that's partially eliminating it. Now, as I said earlier, you could do a blur. I don't think there's an actual blur brush in here. Maybe there is, and I'm totally forgetting it, but Easy, easy enough thing, you could take this into Photoshop, do a stack layer, do a Gaussian blur on one, and then brush out the different areas. And then the last one that I'm gonna show you that I think is really effective, and it's something that I personally do to a lot of my pictures, so if you don't like doing this, then it really may not, you may not, might not be okay with this solution, but add a little bit of green, and that completely eliminates it. So let's go back into here. Uh, let's go and get out of the brushes. I'm going to go down to the green. There we go, green. And I'm gonna add, so remember we're at four to one now. So as I start to add this in, I'll just start sliding it up. You can see the grain obviously being introduced. And at some point the pattern is broken up enough that it's just gone, totally gone there. So that's pretty high on the grain, it's at 35. 
Um, but let's just see what that looks like. Let's take this out to one to one. And there at that point, I think that looks pretty, pretty good in there. And if we zoom out all the way, then you know I like that grain. I like what the grain does to a picture, but it, that may not be okay for you, right? You may not be okay with that. You may want to have a super, super clean image. So, um, so you know, that just is what it is, and that's your choice. But there's four, at least four, and those are the four methods that I came up with playing with this rather quickly that you could use to get rid of that. So is it worth the effort to do it? Well, if you want to have this super high resolution picture, you want to have an 80 megapixel file, and you don't want to go out and buy or rent a massive medium format Q, whatever the heck they're called, back cameras, then uh, this is a perfectly legit way to do it. Yes, the blur is it does have a repeating pattern problem that I can pretty much guarantee is going to show up in print. So you're going to have to do something about that. But again, worth the effort, I think so. So I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to take this photo or one of these pictures, play with it a bit, try and get it ideal. And then um, I'm going to work with a local printer here. I'll probably do some strip tests so I don't have to pay to have, print a huge thing, make sure the pattern's gone, maybe do somewhere I can reduce the amount of grain that's applied to it or something like that and see at what point the pattern visually goes away and, and see how it goes. So so that's that. That's what I wanted to show, show you guys this morning. I'm stoked. I think it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, it was neat to get out there with a the camera and do something like that. And, uh, you know, we all learned something from this one. So that is today's show. We're going to switch over to the Q&A section next. So if you're watching this live, get your questions ready, pop them into the chat, and we will address them. If you're not watching live, well, you can put your questions wherever you like. And, uh, and we will be right back.